So to start off this evening, um, I first want to dedicate tonight's presentation to the memory of Rav uh, David Weiss-Halivni, who passed away today in Jerusalem. Um, it was particularly poignant to hear this news this morning. I first met Rabbi Halivni at Camp Ramon, Canada, and um, it was my great zechut, a lifetime of honor, to sit with him three times a day, I believe, and have meals with him, because we were both sitting at the Han Hala table. I was the program director, he was the professor in residence, I think his son might have been in camp, certainly had been. Um, and it was there that I was able to soak in the light of his scholarship and erudition. He was a very kind and gentle scholar. He was patient and sensitive to anyone who came to him. He played with campers, he taught the staff, he was really a jack of all trades. I've read many and many of his books and articles since then, but I had no idea who he was and what a giant he was in those days. Um, I now know what a zechut it was to be in the presence of this giant of Torah, and I hope that his memory and the memory um, many of his students have of him will be a blessing for all of us and for his family. Amen. Uh, te technical things. Uh, please put questions and comments into the chat. <clears throat> and I'll make every effort to get through them around 8 o'clock. So to begin and recap a little bit, this presentation is about a study of the inverted nun phenomena from relevant literature, traditional Jewish sources, and graphical evidence from scrolls, codices, printed books over, over some millennia. There's 2,000 years plus of rabbinic analysis of this seemingly minute scribal anomaly, and it has produced a significant amount of literature. This is an exposition of the evolution of the markings of, at Numbers 1035 and 36 in our Sefer Torah, as reflected in artifacts, responsa, and interpretive texts. My goal has never been theological. This is not a Dvar Torah. My goal was to document the evolution of this scribal phenomena as well as the accompanying discussion about the design and position of the markings at this place in the Torah. All the text sources are from approved sources available in good Jewish libraries and on the internet. All the changes to the Sefer Torah which will be displayed were made with rabbinic approval, often by the greatest scholars of the day. These changes were all intended by scribes and scholars to improve the quality of the document or scroll they were looking at. There's much more background to all of this in part one. If you missed it, it's available on the uh, Shar Shemaim YouTube channel. So to recap, our text is first mentioned outside the Torah in the Mishnah as a text that is the minimal length for a text to be considered holy. There are brackets, something that are called simaniot, or signs, which obviously are very ancient because they're in the Torah, and they're probably modeled after what we learned last week are called Greek lunate sigma characters, there'll be some examples of those later, which are found surrounding transposed Greek texts. Scribes put them in to say they made a mistake. From the Talmud, we learned a few things about our tradition about these markings. One is that they mark out the, the fourth of the seven books of the, of the Torah, that they are shofar-shaped markings, and they denote this text as one which was transposed and will be placed in its proper place at some future date. It was placed here when it was found needing to be preserved in order to, in, according to the tradition, in order to interrupt the flow of the story where several bad stories were separated by these 85 letters. Sometimes the dots or the markings are called dots because Sifre says that this text is nakud alav, which I think means marked above and not dotted. Rashi says that the markings have to be before and numbers 10, 35, and 36, before Vayihibin Tzawa Haron and after, and that the markings are hafuchin, and this becomes a major subject. 
the markings are hafuchin, which can mean either reversed or inverted. So to recap with some of the images we saw, this is the inverted nun lunate sigma character from a proto Hebrew Leviticus scroll. This is a Dead Sea scroll, and this is written in the old script, not, the, not our contemporary square script. And this is an example of how this was used in an Alexandrian scribal academy. These are the actual dictionary definitions of the Greek diacritical marks that we see as the origin of the inverted nuns. This also can be looked up online. Of course, it said they were dotted, so some people took that literally. And here are examples from the 10th to the 15th century, at least, uh, of inverted nun markings which are dotted. They die out in the Middle Ages. And here, of course, is Maimonides, the Rambam's officially perfect text of the Tanakh with vocalization. We don't have the Bamidbar text that we're looking at mostly, but we have a series of seven inverted nuns here from Psalm 107. And you'll see that there's a basic shape to these. Remember that because it comes in handy later. Notice they're not identical. Notice that there's a Z shape developing. This might be bad calligraphy or it might be tradition. And we move on from here. There were a thousand years of questions that we already posed. What is their purpose? What is their design? What is their location? And what is their symbolism? These questions are constantly being asked every year when we read Parshat Baha'u'llah. I was told that I didn't make a point of why they used a nun. So the answer is all over the map. Once, one idea is that the nun stands for nakud, dotted, or marked. Maybe that was a scribal mnemonic, that the scribe would see the nun, knowing that's a nakud. I don't believe that. I think that's a silly explanation. The shape of the nun is closest to a Hebrew letter, which could be used to describe the shape after Chazal lost the understanding of what the lunate sigma meant. They thought it looked like a nun, so they said it was a nun shape. Uh, they didn't know about sigmas by then. Another possible, well, the other thing is that the other possibility of describing it is a chaf shape, which we'll get to in a minute, but nobody ever did that. Nun equals 50 in, in uh, Gematria, and there's a prominent theory that the proper place for this text of 85 letters is 50 sections earlier in Sefer Bamidbar. No one ever actually points to a specific pasuk or counts 50 the same way, but that's one of the ideas about there being a nun for the markings. Then there is the nun equal to the shechina. We'll mention this in a few minutes again, but that is an idea that's very prominent. I don't think that's where the nun marking comes from. I think it comes from Hellenistic scribal schools. This is the most likely source. Now, we'll go back to what Rashi says, because it's really important as a watershed. He said that the markings indicate that this is not the proper place for this text. That's a Talmudic idea. It was placed here to separate the stories of calamity. That's a Midrashic idea that he incorporates. He tells us that the markings are clearly before and after. Milmala u milmata. And he says they're reversed. But does he mean inverted or does he mean reversed? We talked about this last week a bit. You see on the right, there are four different possibilities for reversed and inverted, and we will see all of these. It's no great bracha that Rashi said they were inverted or hafuchin because he doesn't really explain what that means, and that leads to tremendous confusion. And the first thing I want to throw at you is this total complete anomaly from uh, the most famous book other than Rashi's commentaries to come out of this period of time. This is from Machsor Vitri, which is literally a handbook of how to do Jewish from the Franco-German school gener a generation or two after Rashi. And in it, it's a compendium of how to do stuff, including write the inverted nuns. And you'll notice that on the right-hand side there, 
the artist who did this, the scribe who did this, gave us a facsimile of what he thought they should look like, and it's the complete opposite of what we would expect from what we've looked at for about a thousand years of Jewish literature. Here they actually use the chaf as the facsimile for the nun in, in, in this text, and this is completely unique and even though this text has been around since the 11th century and we've known about it since the 12th in third party references, nobody in all of the research I've done ever mentions this scribal anomaly. Well, there's more. This is something I ran into last winter that is completely unique. There's no references to this in the literature. This is a Persian document of the 11th century. This is old. This is pre-Maimonides. And you'll notice that in the text here, down at the bottom left, this is not a Sefer Torah. It's a, it's a rabbinic Bible with an Arab, uh, a Judeo-Arabic translation. You'll notice there is this seal, which I've um, expanded up here, enlarged up here. And it says that these are segregated new not. It's the only time in all my research where they're referred to as new not as rather than new name. And it says that we write two of them and they're oriented backwards. It took a while to figure out what the code written around this fleur de lis like flowery thing is. But it's the Masoretic note that there are supposed to be inverted nuns at this place. And you'll see down at the bottom of the text there is a sample of what that inverted nun is to look like with a bit of a crown on it, which matches these other markings to the left and right, and the theme of, the, of, these, of that seal. So that is how this Masoretic author, or the person editing this text, chose to tell the community using this text that there was supposed to be an inverted nun here. Lo and behold, while I was looking at this and very proud that I had discovered something I'd never seen, my wife came through, looked at this because I was so excited about it, and she said, look, there's another one that's been erased at the top. And she's right. If you look right at the top, where just about where this circle is, to the left of the circle, the circle should move, and there's a, an enlargement of it on the right-hand side here, and you can see the beginnings of, or, or what's left of an erasure, of the same kind of inverted nun with the flowery crown on top that should appear, that does appear, except that it's erasure, here on top. I would not think that this is erased from overuse because the rest of the text is very clear and pristine. I think someone actually took this out of here and you'll see that's not impossible given the rest of the history. Here is the relevant piece of the earliest and best copy of Rashi's commentary on the Torah. It appears around this text, but I brought this to show you that in the early 13th century, that's about 100 years after Rashi died, less than 100 years, there are very special markings in this text, which comes from somewhere in Franco-Germany. You'll notice that there are two markings here on the left, and they're radically different. And in the early 13th century, someone on this, in this very important scroll, uh, uh, codice, codex included a Z-shaped marking, and both the Z-shaped and the standard reversed backwards nun both have dot markings on top. I would think the dot markings are more Masoretic notes than dots on the markings in the text. But you'll see... This is really early for this phenomenon, early 13th century. And now comes one of the most fascinating pieces in all of this. This is something that literally took me about 40 years to understand, and I think I've almost got it. I'll put the foundation pieces in. Shir HaShirim says, Dome Dodi Litzvi, my beloved is like a gazelle. That's all we have to read about the, the, the Pasuk. The beloved is God. The gazelle disappears very regularly when it goes out to forage for food or tend to its friends, etc. Now, the Zohar does four things in a very complicated text that I'll show you. The first thing we understand is that the Zohar identifies the Shekhinah with the nun that's missing in Ashrei, 
Why? Because just as the Shekhinah sometimes disappears from B'nai Yisrael, the Nun of Ashrei has disappeared and we long for it like we long for the Shekhinah. Foundation piece one. Number two, this I think is phenomenal. The Zohar says that the markings illustrate, and I use that term advisedly and point to it and shout it out, the Torah includes illustrations of the posture of the Shekhinah facing or turning away from B'nai Yisrael on the sojourn in the desert. The Shekhinah resides on top of the Aron Kodesh, which traverses the desert in several days in front of B'nai Yisrael and looks back at the people longingly, and the nuns reversed or backwards note that. There's an interpretive disagreement in the Zohar between Shimon Bar Yochai and his son Eliezer, and that discussion leads to us seeing the argument they're having about what should the inverted nuns in the Torah look like, and they, their evidence is designs for the nun markings that they saw in each of their grandfather's separate personal Torah scrolls. So that's a long-winded story. It's all embedded in the text of the Zohar. And right here is the heart of that argument. So, second line, due to the love of Israel, it turned its face towards them. That's the Shekhinah, turning away from the ark like a gazelle, who, when going, turns its face back to the place it has left. The gazelle looks backward from whence it came. So as the ark journeyed, the nun turned its face toward Israel and its shoulders toward the ark. This is very complicated to read in Zoharic Aramaic because all the pronouns refer one to another in this big uh, ball of knots. And then in the latter, latter part, it says, do not abandon us, turn your face towards us. That's a quote. The nun turned back toward them. And then it says that there's a picture in the text, which isn't really there like someone turning his face toward his beloved. And when the ark in Israel began to rest, the nun turned its face from Israel and turned back toward the ark, turning completely. Very complicated. I'm not sure anyone really understands it. But this is what they're talking about. How do we write the, the nun marking? Should it be like the left-hand gazelle looking forward? Or should it be like the right-hand gazelle looking backward? Now, I don't know where the chicken and the egg is here, whether the design was modeled on the gazelles, it does say domed, dozi, litzvi, or whether the shape of the gazelles was seen as being related to the markings. But this is how the Zohar envisions this mystical idea and tells us that the markings in the Torah are illustrations. In the Cairo Geniza, which can be dated let's say 11th century, it includes material much older, we find markings shaped as circled there, which very much resemble the markings that I think are like the gazelle. That means that this was a popular marking back then. Clearly, by the time the Zohar was hit the stands, the new stands in the late 13th century, this was a known marking and one of the Torahs, of the uh, Bar Yochai boys, grandfathers, had a lun that looked like that in it. But at the same time in the Cairo Geniza, you find a much more standard shaped nun like you're seeing here in a Cairo Geniza working Bible. Most interestingly, Maimonides, probably the greatest Jewish legal scholar and certainly the greatest codifier, makes absolutely no mention of these markings in Sefer Bar. Nothing, even, not even an oblique reference. There are many theories about this. It's been an enigma forever. It's possible that he didn't know about them, but I think that's silly because all Sefer Torah, as far as I can tell, to his date, had inverted nuns in them. Maybe he didn't think they should be there. A possibility, the Rambam leaves out things that he thinks should fall by the wayside from our tradition. M much of that is documented. 
maybe he thought that these were extraneous, that's a theory, and they shouldn't be there, that they made a Torah puzzle. Maybe he includes them when he makes a reference to special letters in general in the, in, uh, the, more, in the uh, Yada Chazaka. Uh, but it's not clear because he mentions other kinds of letters which aren't in our Sefer Torah generally, but doesn't mention the inverted nuns. And this is a likely possibility that he had already given approval to the Aleppo Codex as the perfect document, the perfect Tanakh, they were in there, we think, because they're in the Psalm 107. We assume they were, they were in Numbers 10. So perhaps he was just saying that the perfect text with all the appropriate letters is visible in, including the inverted nuns, in the Aleppo Codex. One day I hope we'll find out. But the Rambam does not mention these, and that's just a fascinating quirk in itself. This is the oldest Sefer Torah that we know about. It was discovered, uh, misfiled in a library in Bologna, Italy, several years ago. Um, and it looks like this. Notice it doesn't have crowns and jots and tittles on the letters, except for here the Samach of Bin Soa, which is obviously some scribal tradition. Uh, the Nunim are pretty standard for what we've seen to date, and they're in the text uh, before and after, uh, not really as brackets, but almost as space fillers. <clears throat> now, we get to the late 13th century. You'll notice that the 13th and 14th century appear a lot. Here we have a phenomenon that I thought didn't happen until the 16th century, but obviously research proved otherwise. You'll notice that in these three documents, only the center document is a Sefer Torah. The other two are uh, rabbinic Bibles. They include Masoretic information. But you can see that the scribe has introduced Z-shaped characters in the left-hand one into the text of the Torah. That's a radical move. Again, I emphasize this was not done lightly. It was done to fulfill what he and his rabbinic supervisor and the editor of the text believed was the appropriate Masoretic thing to do. Here it's in a Sefer Torah in two places again, in the Binsoa and in Uvnucho, but not in Kemit Onanim in that text. And here you have a different symbol inserted in the same places, much more like the symbol we've been seeing today. So it appears that the 13th century was really a hotbed of discussion about what these markings should look like. Um, and of course, by this time, the Zohar is having an influence on the text. We have no idea who started this tradition or who it was approved by, uh, but it didn't happen by accident. Shalom, Th those seem to yeah. be, Shalom, those seem to yeah. be replacing our you know, our, our own, like what we understand is the inverted nuns. In other words, I don't see the nuns bracketing the text. Yes. I see them inside the text. So this is you're a replacement. Yeah. You're right. That's exactly what you're seeing. They felt that this is the appropriate place for what the Mishnah and the Gemara refer to, or the, what the Gemara refers to as the new nin hafuchin. This is, they, they, this is their interpretation of Rashi's before and after. And there's huge amounts of halakhic literature trying to justify this. I'm just working on some of that now. But it takes a few hundred years till people realize they need a halakhic justification for this, and it develops. But this seems just to have been a tradition that developed, moving them inside the text. It becomes more complicated. This is, for, for comparison's sake, scrolls from around Europe around the same time. And you'll see it's a whole range of things. On the bottom right, we have a dotted marking from Persia, it's very Z-shaped. You see sort of Z-shapes developing in the other one. The top left-hand one is a very important text we'll see later that was used more, more recently for important purposes. And there you see two different markings. Again, on the top left from Parma, Italy, there's a certain amount of inconsistent calligraphy in those markings, but they generally look the same. And you'll see similar markings from Spain down below. So the 13th century is really a hotbed. Here's some more from the 13th century. These are both 
intralinear targumim. So there's a Hebrew text followed by uh, an uh, a Judeo-Arabic text or or an Aramaic text. In these Bibles, they're not they're not Torah scrolls, but you can see that the one on the left has an has is bracketed, preceded, and followed by an inverted nun shape, and the one on the right has a bit of a Z shape at the top, and your standard bracket on the bottom. The two markings in the middle of the right hand text are placeholders. They're not inverted nuns. They sometimes look like inverted nuns. They didn't want to leave the space empty at the end of these lines, and there wasn't enough room to put in the next line or the next word, so they put in a filler. You see that a lot in medieval manuscripts. Now, here are some other wild and wacky locations for the inverted nuns. The left-handed document is the, as I conflated those two, I glued them together. It's the bottom of one column and the top of another column. But you'll notice that both of the inverted nun markings, Z-shaped, are in the middle of the text. Sorry, that's not true. They're not. They're at the beginning at the end, but they're broken up by the line, and they are Z-shaped. On the other side of the page is not, not a, a, a document from not much different in time, where similarly Germanic, it shows that the markings are both collected together as a pair at the end of the text. There's nothing at the beginning of the text. So again, a different interpretation of the tradition. No more information about these. Some of the inf sometimes these documents come with nothing more than a date or a place. Not to think that there isn't a full range of possibilities in the 13th century. Here you see three scrolls. These, these are two scrolls on the right and a, and a uh, book on the left where there is no inverted known whatsoever. So we've gone full circle from before and after to inside the text to not appearing at all. So apparently there were scrolls that were considered kosher that held that there should not be any markings there at all. And we'll see rabbinic opinions about that as we move forward. Here is, a, uh, I think, a tale of 500 years that really speaks to the desire to preserve traditions. On the left-hand side is one of the documents we've seen earlier from the Geniza, a 10th or 11th century, with a backwards nun shaped marking with a little bit of a horn. 300 years later, you have this document which is almost chosen at random. I could have chosen others that show the same thing, but you see a very, very similarly shaped nun, backwards nun. And in 1546, Daniel Bomberg, who we'll hear more about later, he's the preeminent Jewish printer in Venice in the 16th century, he, he publishes a text called Pesicta Zutarta, kind of an esoteric Midrash text, and in it, are the same markings. I'm pointing out that for over 500 years, this tradition of this shape marking remained solid with the same text. This is the text from Psikta Zutarta on the left-hand side from the Cairo Geniza, and this is the same text on the right-hand side from Bomberg's Press in the middle of the 16th century. A very strong tradition that that's imp important. And here you have, just for completeness sake, a random selection of 13th and 14th century designs that show a range of shapes. Some of them have an elongated bottom foot. Some of them are more Z-shaped or angular than others. Some of them are more curvilinear. The third one on the second row is Z-shaped, as is the fifth one where there's a dot on it. It's really, really a dog's breakfast, and all of these were considered appropriate, and if they were Sifre Torah, there was no choice but to use them. And here, one of my favorites, artistic license and scribal creativity led to these backward nun-shaped markings in a uh, 14th century French Bible, and the scribe was obviously being 
very playful in making the nun into an arm shape with little fingers on the end. It's quite astounding. The manuscript itself is beautiful. There's all kinds of pretty things in it, but I didn't discover anything um, nearly as earth shattering as this. Now we get to the 15th century where we see more, a larger range, a broader range in markings. You'll see on the top left, very much a Z-shaped marking. And in the Judeo-Persian document in the middle, a very stylized marking on the left, much more curvilinear, and a pretty standard square, long-footed marking on the right. Pretty standard stuff on the right-hand top column. The bottom left is a, for the, one of the early examples of an inverted and backwards nun. We'll see many more of those soon. The 15th century Spanish document in the bottom middle has interesting crowns on top, and it's a shape that is really unique, and I think it speaks to the artistic license, but it's a crowned marking, which is kind of rare. And on the bottom right, again, we saw a few minutes ago, two markings paired up at the end of the text. There it is again, and that's in the middle of the text. And the first nun of Binsoa is reversed. This is a uh, strange configuration. It's quite unique. But it shows you that through the 15th century, things are very much in flux. Here's another example of that kind of flux. Shalom, sorry to so, interrupt. Shalom, so sorry. Yeah, sure. uh, it, it should be noted that it normally uh, when, when uh, Sofer does a nun, it does have a crown. Uh, that's true. Not, uh, uh, the, three, the three lines coming up in that 15th century yeah, this, Spain. So that's a right. normal thing for a nun where we haven't seen that before. That kind exactly. of, that kind of uh, messes up the theory that they're nunim. Um, you know, because... Why? Well, a nun would, should have, should have the, the crown, right? I mean, like... Ah, so, so one of the questions discussed by the medieval halakhic authorities is whether these are letters or symbols, random symbols, and the tradition changed. Some scrolls, ha some scrolls have no crowns, jots and tittles whatsoever. You'll notice that the one we're talking about there, the bottom middle one, the, the letters of the text have no crowns. Only the yeah. nun in there has the crowns. That's crazy, yeah, that's interesting. So it's, it's, uh, that's, what's, that's what's interesting. In this one, we see a very similar scroll. These all seem to be around the 15th century as well. But on the left scroll, you see inverted, reversed nun. And on the right side, you see just a reversed nun. No, nobody knows why. These are traditions that developed. And here you have something that from my earliest days doing this research, I said would be, so to speak, part of the expression, the Holy Grail. Will I ever find a scroll where every possible nun is treated somehow? And here you see it. The nun before and the nun after, the nun of Binsoa, the nun of Uvnucho with a crown on it, and an inverted nun in Kemit Onanim. There's still um, a nun in Misan Echa that nobody ever played with, that I ever found, and the Vayanusu nun has a crown on it, but is not treated as a, as a nun. You'll see this more pronounced later, but it seems that everybody had an opinion and was able to get it implemented into a Sefer Torah. So an overview of this hundred years that I'm calling the 16th century, what a century. This is when, when you sit back and think what was going on here over a hundred years. Gutenberg, who invented the European uh, printing press in the late, halfway through sort of the 15th century, is the anchor point. The press hits the world and books start to be published um, immediately. And there were lots of Jewish books published immediately. The Jews are expelled from Spain in 1492. That brings them to all kinds of new places. Daniel Bomberg, a non-Jewish wealthy entrepreneur invests a tremendous amount of money in publishing Hebrew books um, by the thousands. 
and he dies 1549. While he's alive, Solomon Luria, who we'll look at in a few minutes, writes some major, major halachic works. The Maharshal, Solomon Luria, was the preeminent halachic authority in Europe at the beginning of the 16th century and well through it. His rival and friend, fellow student, was the Maharam, mayor of Lublin. He died in 1616. They were both students of Moses Isserlis, the famous Ramah, who wrote the glosses on Yosef Karo's Shulchan Aruch. So in this hundred years, there are giants of halacha dealing with some of the issues of the inverted nuns while the printing press is warming up. The printing press and the inverted nuns are a big issue because just what are you supposed to put on the paper that comes out of the press to make the appropriate kosher Bible? So we're going to look at four individuals who lived at this period of time who are major players in the history of the text of the Torah. Two halachists, Solomon Luri and Meir ben Gedalia, the Maharam of Lublin, and two Italian Masoretic scholars, Menachem de Lanzano and Yedidia Norzi, who are the pinnacle of halachic literature. They were both born in Italy. They were buddies. They spent a lot of time in the Middle East looking for documents together and writing with each other's works in mind. And it's really quite interesting that we have a window into this. Just for background, I'm not dealing with any of these documents about the inverted nuns through from the 11th to the 18th century, even though each one of them is significant to my story, especially the last one from the 18th century. But these are things that I'll deal with sometime in the future. They're all very interesting. They're much more drasha oriented and mystically oriented, um, and they're all written by important personalities of these years. We start with the Maharshal, Solomon Luria. Uh, he wrote two works. The first one we're looking at here is Chochmat Shlomo. It's a smaller halakhic work. And he has the audacity to say here that in corrected texts, that means a scroll or a document that was worked on by scholars to improve its quality and its accuracy, he did not see the diacritical marks, the inverted nuns. Now, that statement is astounding in itself when, when we read on. It seems to me that they are invalid according to what becomes invalidated by even one extraneous or lacking letter. He's saying the markings, if they appear, make a safer Torah pasul, which means that if you go according to his psaq, Every Sefer Torah that any gentleman that I know of, that anyone's ever had an aliyah on in the modern world, was done over a Puzzle Sefer Torah. Now, I have not yet discovered any reaction to this hugely powerful earthquake statement, but it doesn't last very long. Because he changes his mind for a whole bunch of reasons, and doesn't stand by that opinion within a few years. In the Yom Shoshlomo, a massive work that we don't have all of, but we've got a good chunk of it on, on the Bavli, he says that it's also surprising to find these markings in there since an inverted letter is not a letter. It's true. If you invert an L, it's not an L. And there is no greater way to change a letter than this. So he's saying that the markings are not letters, and therefore maybe they don't make the Sefer Torah puzzle when they're before and after the text. And he, he, he makes an interesting comment here at the bottom. If so, since the scribe accepted the tradition to invert the letters, we should, milachatchila ab initio, invert them and certainly not nullify them. He completely changes his opinion. He says, if you find a Sefer Torah where there are these inverted nuns, then the scribe put them in there on his own recognizance, which the Rambam allows in Hilchot Sifrei Torah, and we shouldn't call that Sefer Torah with the extraneous nuns, Puzzle. It would be kosher for use. So already you see the halakhic turmoil that's going on here, and much of this is happening, I believe, because the printing press's editors, the people who are deciding what's going to actually go onto the press, are having this discussion 
about what do you do about these nuns? They've seen many, many different versions, and they have to come to an opinion. He eventually says that there's been a mistake here in our tradition, but we can't do anything about it. He uses this Talmudic phrase, kevan de al al, sorry. Once an error occurs, it's impossible to eradicate it because that's what he's seeing. And he makes an, he gives an opinion here. Interestingly, while he's writing about the inverted nuns, he makes an aside and he says during his research, he discovered the Zohar, meaning it was the first time he learned Zohar. And he found something valuable for this discussion in the Zohar. And he says, all of a sudden, never having heard of the Zohar before, that the truth is in the Zohar, and he's going to bring the proper design and, or, and location of the markings based on the Zohar. And he says that the reason he's holding by this new opinion in the Zohar is because the Zohar has been around since the days of Shimon Bar Yochai, which is the tale told about the Zohar. He says in the middle of the discussion, and after that I studied the Zohar, which is the source. Now, I've never made a decision about what he means by which is the source, Shemimeno Yavoha Makor. It's likely that he means the source of the problem of the inverted nuns. It's also possible he means this is the source of this Torah. He says this is a completely different issue that is not at all dependent on the markings, but is closer to the shot of the text. From it, we understand that even in the days of the Tanaim, there was a tradition amongst them regarding the inversion of the nuns, but a doubt arose among the texts. And that's why you see many different versions of the marking. So he's saying, we really don't have an accurate text, and I don't know what to do with these markings. And he was a scientist. And he says he went out and collected in his neighborhood, which let's say is let's say 12 miles around his house. He found these 12 different versions of the implementations of the markings. And he describes them. And um, an author in the early 20th century transcribed his descriptions into this typeset text. And you see here 12 permutations and combinations of where inverted known markings might appear in scrolls and uh, books of the 16th century. Um, the one that's most interesting is the one on the bottom, the 12th, where there's an inverted nun above every nun that he could find in the text. Um, pretty astounding. And what does a halachic do, halachist do with this when he's got to dis decide what this, a kosher sefer Torah is? Maharshal lists how to fix each of these or how to remove them from circulation. In essence, at the bottom, the, the real fundamental thing that the, the Maharshal says that we've all got it wrong and these markings aren't actually physical markings in his opinion. In his discussion, he says that they were, the, the markings that are referred to in the literature are the spaces before and after the text, which leave the text standing on its own, um, seemingly like an independent book of the Bible. Uh, but he says um, that God knows the symbols, the, the parshiot to be those symbols. No one else ever says that, but others base their discussion on things like that that the Maharshal said. Now, here is a watershed, a, a major issue. When Bomberg published the first Mikraot Gedolot like Bible, 1540, 1524. This is why Mikra look the way they do. He inserted the nun into the text, as you see on the right-hand side. The nun of Bin Soa and the nun of Kemit Onani, like we saw in earlier scrolls, was inserted into the text. His editor was a very learned man, um, someone who knew what he was doing in editing this text, and for one reason or another, he chose to use this less than normative, rather esoteric tradition to, to include the markings in these locations. No one had ever done this before in print, because print wasn't a thing yet, 
But this was radical for this to be made official by the thousands in this very important document. However, we know already we've seen and we see more here, Nun's reversed or inverted inside the text is not something unique to the Bomberg 1524 edition. The, the scroll on the bottom left, which is enlarged on the bottom right, I have no information about its location or date, but it's an example of the inverted nun being stylized with curly cues. The Rambam talks about letters with curly cues and, 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 and whirly gigs on them. And here you see inverted reversed nuns with curly cues on them embedded in the text of a Sefer Torah. Over the years that the Bombergs, the Bomberg was publishing texts, his design for the nuns changed. And you can see them here. In 1517, he was printing the first Bible in his, from his press, and they looked very much like just inverted reverse nuns. Similarly, in 1546, we saw the 1524 earlier, where he's changed, the editor has changed where the inverted nuns go. Torah Hashem Tamima is another edition of, uh, from, uh, it's a copy a reprint of a Bomberg Bible from a Bomberg press. And again, we saw the 1546 Sikta Zutrata, where another design, similar but different, it's not inverted, it's just reversed, design is implemented. So they're all over the place from the same publishing house. And now, in, in, in the later part of the 16th century, um, another great scholar, the Maharam of Lublin, um, takes issue with many of the things the Maharshal said. And he says, um, it's apparent that the Midrashim and the interpretations which I referred to earlier in his essay do not agree with Luria's statements. And therefore, one shouldn't nullify a Torah in which these inverted nuns are written because there's some authority for this. So this was probably written before the Maharshal retracted his original statement that they make a safer Torah puzzle. But Notice what he says here. He says, the inverted nuns are okay to be there. One shouldn't nullify a Torah scroll in which they're there because there's some authority for this. Yeah, there's already about 1,500 years of normative, normative rabbinic tradition for this authority, but that doesn't seem to be the issue here. So he says he doesn't have an authority to nullify a scroll which doesn't have the inverted nuns in them since there are midrashim that divide the issue about what these symbols look like. We don't know exactly what he's referring to. The Sifre says they're only dots, if you understand nakudalav meaning dotted. So it would appear that it would be sufficient to have any recognizable symbol used, as long as they're distinguished from the section before, like brackets, and after it. As Luria wrote, and Luria did say this, why do I need these markings or dots or spaces? What's their point? He gave up. The Maharam says something astounding here, that the nuns of Bin Soa, according to all, must be inverted. According to all, de Kula Alma, he's saying that his halachic decision is that every Sefer Torah according to every scribe and authority, has an inverted nun in the word bin tzola. And a scroll in which there are inverted nuns in bin tzola, oops, and after and in uvnucho and in kemit onanim, if they're all inverted, it should not be nullified because it's written according to the interpretation of the psikta and the zohar. I never understood where he gets this in the psikta or the zohar. I take his word for it, but you'll notice the crowned nun there and all of the nuns, as I showed before, are included in this document that he says is the proper one. So he says that nuns, the nun of Bin Soa should be inverted totally, its head turned below, and that he puts a picture in. We don't have a, I don't have a picture of that. But the nun of Uvnocha is inverted from front to back. So here he's distinguishing between merely upside down and right to back, that, and front to back. That doesn't happen in very many descriptions, and it's 
handy for him to use that, and he, it shows his description of his understanding of the Zohar. And here you see two scrolls with inverted and reversed markings. It never stays the same. Now we come to a fascinating character we don't know very much about. Menachem de Lanzano, as I said earlier, was an Italian who ended up in uh, Jerusalem and, and elsewhere in the Middle East looking for manuscripts, Sifre Torah, that would enable him to uh, compile a proper final Ma Masoretic notes on everything in Tanakh. And he did an amazing job doing exactly that. <clears throat> but he takes Bomberg to task. It's 100 years after Bomberg published the 1524 Bible. And he says there are errors in the large and small Bibles. That's the 1517 and 1524 editions. He said, not only did he reverse the marking, turning it backwards, he also inverted it top to bottom, placing the head of the nun at the bottom and the foot above. He says, this never occurred to anybody to do, and it's wrong. So all those Sifre Torah that we saw written with inverted nuns and inverted reverse nuns, this master of this literature says they're all possible. But he does something else that is fascinating and could only happen uh, in the middle of the 15th century. He blames the technology for Bomberg's problem. He says, I know it would be difficult in the world of printing to make a backwards nun as it should be without initial preparation. I think he means spending money on making another letter to use. Since this requires great effort, where the, whereas the poured, which meaning the, the stuff that his engineers made out of lead to set the type of the, of the Bible, the prepared stuff and available nuns cannot be reversed face backwards without inverting the head to the bottom and the foot to the top. I'll explain what that means in a minute. Thus, the viewer, that's the kore, the reader of the scroll, in, which includes the mistake he's referring to, doesn't know that it's the art of printing which caused this error. Since not everyone is knowledgeable about printing and the reader thinks that this was done intentionally and that it should be this way. He's saying when you open a book and you see something printed there, you don't know if it's there for good reason or bad reason. And what he's saying is that what he did here with what Delonzana was saying, Bomberg did, he cheaped out and he didn't make new letters, which would enable the engineers to take the piece of type with the proper inverted nun and insert it in the block of type properly so it would look right. In other words, blaming the technology for the letter that looks out of place. Now, the problem with this theory is that if you look at Bomberg's Bible on the bottom left, you'll see that he does use a different nun character. They didn't just flip over the nun that is in Min HaMachane and use it for Bin Soa. So either I don't have enough information about what Delonzana was actually looking at, or I don't understand why he's saying this, because his excuse that the technology caused this problem doesn't ring 100% true. He also has other, many other issues with, with uh, Bomber. Delonzano ends up saying that he would actually like to see this design as described in the Zohar like a gazelle when, who, when going, turns its face to the place that it has left. He likes this design because of the Zohar. But he says at the bottom, since he hasn't found a, scroll, a, des, a design like this in any scroll, even though it's minadin, logically correct, he cancels his opinion and withdraws his statement. Even though we know there are Sifre Torah that preceded him with markings like that. The th one, a third error that de Lanzano finds in the Bomberg Bibles is that the marks are inverted top to bottom. And he says, this has never crossed anyone's mind. It's not correct to do this specifically after we were informed in the Zohar that the intent of these backward nuns is to hint about the Shina, who was symbolically represented in the letter nun. And we know why. It is certainly not respectful to heaven to invert the head downward and the foot above. Please note that it's only 200 or so years since the Zohar appeared on the newsstands, and its influence 
is astounding. It goes from nothing to influencing the actual writing of the Sefer Torah, and according to some scholars, it illustrates the position of the Shina as we traveled through the desert. We come now to the final halachic authority. Uh, if you have a good mikra or kedolot, um, you will find the commentary of Minchat Shai in the back. It's not the complete commentary. There are several versions from different manuscripts, but um, it's a popular back of the book commentary because it's the final word on the Masoretic um, accuracy of the Sefer Torah. So Mincha Chai, who was a friend of De Lanzano's and they worked together and shared information, um, he says the printers have made varied mistakes and there is a very well-known um, mistake, Ta'ut Zema for some. There are those who place the marking before Vayibin Sol Aron and after it they put a Nun that's larger than the rest of the letters and inverted the head of the nun downward and its foot upward. That's something we saw in the Bomberg books. It's not proper to do this. And the Raubag, Levi Ben Gershom, another commentator who's in the Mikro Kedolot, he wrote, I don't know what these dots or markings are. Why, whether it's dots or markings, I think he means markings, Nikudot, in that sin. I have not yet found the Raubag where it actually says that. And here, here I, I had the zechut last winter to find the actual manuscripts of Minchat Shai to see what his pen put into the manuscript as the appropriate markings. Um, Minchat Shai is an interesting um, story. Uh, he wrote this manuscript, I'll show you a picture of it in a minute, and it was not published for over a hundred years till well into the 7th to the 18th century. Um, so it's really actually sort of unknown to the general rabbinic public and is not considered one of the classic commentaries, but it's important enough to have in the Mikra Otkodolot. And he tells us that in a few scrolls, the whole nun is reversed backwards, and that's from one of the manuscripts we saw, and I'll show you again. And it's found like this in the Psikta of Rav Tuvia. We saw that both in a Dead Sea Scroll version and in a Bomberg Press version and similarly shows the language of the Zohar, again capitulating to the design mentioned in the Zohar for that marking. But in most scrolls of Svarad, they, the scholars consider the scrolls of Svarad, Sifre Svarad, as different and often better. They leave the face of the Nun as is, reversing the foot. And that's what's shown in the manuscripts of Minchat Shai. It's the same size as the rest of the letters of scrolls, and he says it's the design of the medieval Parshan Bible interpreter, the Rikinati. He says it's like a man prostrate on his knees before the king asking for his needs. And that's what this would look like. We have scrolls with those kinds of nuns in it. And he finally says at the end that it really should be the backwards nun that we saw in, in uh, Cairo Geniza scrolls and the Pasikta scroll that was preserved over those years. This is the manuscript of Minchat Shai. There are two of them and they have different pieces in them. Um, if you try to read this, you won't get very far. It takes a very long time to figure out how to read this because it's, it's written in sort of almost um, a graphical code. But if you will, you'll notice at the bottom, the last line, he, it's, sorry, the last line is where he says, Adam hakorea al birkav, like a man who's um, uh, uh, um, uh, kneeling on his knees. Lifne, uh, what's he say? Milifne hamelech, umvakesh mimenot srachav. So it's hard to read this, but it's these original designs of the markings that this Masoretic genius thought were the appropriate markings important to show that. This is the manuscript that Nortzi thought was the best one he could find. And to add a cherry to the top of this evolutionary process, here you see it actually in action. From this manuscript, this text was published over a hundred years later. And you'll see that 
In the text, there are these inverted nun markings, but there's also notes here on the side which provide a different design. And then there's a third design over here with another note that someone wrote in here that it's inverted with a question mark and an exclamation mark. We don't know who did this. This is from those that early printing. And it shows you that you never know what the source of the change here is because you don't know where it's coming from. It could be the rabbi, it could be the scribe, it could be the scribe's yeshiva, the scribe's teacher. It could be an enterprising individual who saw something somewhere else and wrote it into this manuscript, and now it's preserved for us forever. That's what that looks like at large. You'd never know what to do here or what to expect in an actual Sefer Torah. Here are seven Sefer Torah that at this moment reside in the Heichal of uh, Sherith Israel congregation in Nashville, Tennessee. And you'll see what happens in a modern congregation. All of these scrolls are in very good condition. Most of them look very modern, but you'll see, no, I think no two of them are the same. And you'll, if you look through, you'll see designs we've seen elsewhere. They're all outside the text in the space before and after. And they show the range that a modern scribe has in making the inverted nuns in numbers. And here, a treasure. This is by Ibn Sawah Aron from the Kaifeng Sefer Torah. It's said to be 17th century-ish. No crowns, no jots and tittles, no inverted nun markings. And it looks very Chinese script-like. From the local neighborhood here, literally within walking distance of where I am, there are these three Sifre Torah, um, not much of a provenance on them, but they again show a range and some interesting anomalies. Each one of these has, uh, each, each different scroll has at least one nun marking with a crown on it. Some of them are inverted and reversed. Here's crowns above and below for sort of mirror images of the same marking. Here's one with a Z with one without a Z. And the Z is in a different place on the bottom, top and bottom. That's the range we have right in the neighborhood. These are the facsimile markings that I worked with for the first 30 or so years. These are found in Menachem Kasher's Torah Shlema. Uh, an amazing work of 47 volumes on the Torah uh, uh, that has all kinds of information, including much information I use on the inverted nuns. But he took a pen and made similar markings that are confusing in some cases. Here you see on the bottom left the fishhook markings that I mentioned in my first presentation. And you see that the man beseeching God for his needs in both different directions like the Zohar. And here's the one with the curly Q on it. So these were a mystery to me until I went into the manuscripts. Somehow or other, in the 20, throughout the 20th century, Kusher got his own access to these manuscripts that are all over the world and was able to make these drawings for us that kept pushing me to find more and more. And here is the one thing that needs its own piece of research. This is from an unknown text, very rarely referred to. We have one copy of this that came to us through India somehow. It purports to be a Geniza document. It has a copy in it of Ashray with a with including a pasuk for the Nun. So we know there's a copy from the Dead Sea Scrolls with a Nun verse and Chazal conjecture what the Nun verse is. But here you have an ashray from a Jewish source that has a pasuk that reads, Naflu kol oivecha Hashem v'chol giborehem baltu or kaltu. Both of them sort of make sense. But the nun of this extra verse is reversed. And I think that shows that the scribe knew that if you want to point out something special about a verse that's out of place, transposed, misplaced. This is how you would do it. And he added that into that. Um, and that's something that is yet to be written about. 
So with that, I will call it quits and unshare the screen and open us up to questions because there may be one or two. Any questions? Hello? Am I hearing you? Gita, unmute. I wouldn't deign to, to question you about all the research you did and the billion variations and combination for permutations. But I'm just curious about is how the heck you could get, I mean, you're not that old a person. How could you long enough to get all these variants like from many, many, did you travel? I mean, how did you COVID, actually? COVID was very, very good for my research. <laughs> I once, after I found the first manuscript, and I don't know what it was, it became easier and easier and easier to find the next ones. Uh -huh. They're not in that many places. The Bodleian, the British Museum, the British Library, the Vatican. Um, Hebrew University has a database that points so you directly to the manuscript. Mm -hmm. One thing led to another. The trick was actually opening up the manuscript and... They're, they're huge. The documents are huge. They're multi megabytes, any one of them, and leafing through until I found the right spot. I had to learn how to recognize parts of the Torah that I don't know off by heart. So the trick was to find Birkat Kohanim and then move from there. It often took at least 10 minutes, sometimes a half an hour, to find the actual piece of the scroll I was looking for. And then I made some pictures and put them in the databases and annotated them and yes. went on to the next one. And okay. in some places, like the British Library, there are dozens. And the Vatican has, I don't know what the number is, easily hundreds of copies of the Pentateuch, labeled Hebrew Bible, Pentateuch. So you look for ones that from the outside look like a scroll, and, or they're described as a scroll, and then you download it, pop it open, and do the work. It takes, Very easy, oh, very easy. It, it, <laughs> It was fun because I knew there was always something around the corner. And it, I was right. There were things that would pop out that blew my mind that I thought would be there that I thought I could find. And there they were. OK, thank you. Hello? Yeah. What's the state uh, of the current scholarship on this topic? Is there anybody that has written about it other than you? Yeah, not things that are what I've done. Um, if you think about it, um, and my mentor Barry Levy says, there is no work like this. And you think about it simply because what other pasuk of the Torah can you do this on? Now, to be fair, it's a standard exercise in the history of Parshanut to take a pasuk and write the history of the interpretation of the Pasuk. I did that with the Hanafilim Hayuba Aretz. That's amazing where you, you find 150 interpretations of a verse and you watch it grow and evolve over the decades. This is different because it's not textual and it's a marking, it's a symbol for something. So part of the discussion is what is this for and how, how, how easily fixed is it because it's not part of the fixed text uh, many of the halachas say you're not messing with the torah when you're messing with the inverted known even if they're in the text so there was just all this leeway and it blossomed and not everybody ever had access to all the stuff that i have access to so this kind of work either well, certainly hasn't been done on many psukim, and it's a question about whether it can be done. You, uh, you could do a research essay on research on the big bait at the beginning of Sefer Bereshi and look at Sifrei Torah across the generations and see that. But I don't think there's anything. Maybe you could do it with the configuration of Az Yashir or Birkat Kohanim, but nothing has the meat that the inverted nuns have, so I've discovered. There are some questions in the chat, which I will look at now and see where that goes. Okay, so. Um, 
So Simcha Mendelssohn says the issue here is the shape and form. That's exactly right. Uh, shape and form is all I was ever really concerned about. Um, uh, someone said it's hard to know where to start. A uh, fascinating mystery. That's exactly what keeps me going. Um, just as an aside, I'm working on something now that may take me a year. Uh, four chuvas from the 18th century Lvov, a relatively unknown man that I know nothing about, wrote four incredibly detailed halachic chuvas, which completely turned the whole issue on its head. And he uses a purely halachic argument using rabbinic sources to completely recontextualize the whole foundational understanding of the Gemara that leads to all of this. And he takes him four tshuvas back and forth, reaction and response. It's huge, and it really might take me a year because it's very slow going. So there's much more to say about this. Um, I love people who make jokes in the chat. Uh, notes in the margins. Uh, Ruvain, notes in the margins are the Masoretic notes. They come in, they're in, they're, they're in codices, not in scrolls. They're the manuscripts. They are the system, the notes of system that says, this word is spelled way, this way, these three places, and it's different in that place. And that's a system that enables us to keep the Torah spelled correctly and vocalized correctly. It doesn't work all that well over the 2,000 years, but that's what those little markings and notes in the, in the margins are. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, I have a comment, or, or actually a question. Can you speak about, you used the word pasul quite a few times, relating to these nuns what about what about um, words that have missing letters in them and at the side of the text you'll see which letters are missing in a word now right. why are why is the safer torah considered kosher if we've got missing letters in words great question you may have noticed in this last, last week's Parsha, uh, Parsha uh, Naso, was that Naso? No, Shlach, Shlach. Shlach, right near the end, I think it was in Shishi, there was the word Chatat, and it was Chaser Aleph, it was missing an Aleph. And uh, several weeks ago, not more than three or four, a, an exactly similar phenomenon, a letter, is, a word is missing, Chatat is missing the Aleph. Well, the history of the tradition of the text shows that that just happens. You have one safer that has the mistake in it, and it's copied by another sofer, and it, pro it proliferates. That's likely how it happens. It's a scribal error, but when it goes into a kosher safer, the next scribe is very reticent to fix the mistake, and he may not see it. Ultimately, it becomes part of the tradition that it's missing an Aleph. The Korean Ktiv system is probably just that kind of thing. There were different versions, and Chazal decided to record the different versions. And there you see Vavs that turned into Yuds, Yuds that turns into Vavs, spelling mistakes, words without, with extra letters, words that are spelled differently, and, or, or read and not written. There's lots of different scribal tradition built into just the way a scribe is supposed to write a proper Sefer Torah. Are any two Sefer Torah the same down to the letter that you're referring to? I don't think so. I don't think they're all, they're, they're, they don't all match each other and it's relatively easy to find two Sefer Torah with differences in word spellings. <coughs> That's a, I'm not saying that telling tales at a school. That's the fact of the history of our tradition. Does that answer the question? I, I suppose it does, but so I'm, so... I'm willing to say it's a spelling mistake as well. So can one not say similar things about the nuns? Sure. 
I think I've demonstrated that scribes and their rabbinic supervisors took liberties with the shape and location of the nuns. That's, that's the story here, that for whatever reason, when it, I actually had a conversation with a scribe about two or three years ago after COVID started. Um, I, I, found him, I found some work of his on the internet and I, I phoned him. Um, lives in Belgium and he was then working on a Sefer Torah for his own personal use. And we had a long discussion about what design and location he was going to use for the inverted nuns in his new Sefer Torah. It appeared that he had a choice and he would get it approved. I think he was a Rav himself, but he, it would be approved because he chose to use it. That's how fluid this is, even to our day. The seven Sifre Torah in Nashville sort of demonstrate that, that scribes have a hand in this and their rabbi gives them approval and who's going to contradict the two of them? Okay, all right. It's not the story we heard in Hebrew school, so to speak. So with that, if there are no more questions, I don't see anything else in the chat. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, Ruvain asks the question, how do we then comprehend and understand the notion that everything in our Torah comes from Moshe at Har Sinai, I assume? Well, my simple answer is, since we got it at Har Sinai, we've been responsible for preserving it and reproducing it and um, ensuring that our tradition survives based on it. But it's been in the hands of man since then. And to think that men could preserve it 100% perfectly. Don't get me wrong. The text of the Torah is incredibly well preserved over thousands of years when we compare to Dead Sea Scrolls. Incredible. But there are things that aren't the same. And uh, we have, the tradition acknowledges them. This discussion that we're having here about the accuracy of the text and whether we should fix it and change it is on the minds and pens of halakhic scholars throughout the generations. Uh, there's many volumes that describe uh, the back and forth between major scholars about whether we should correct the Torah based on the Midrash, based on the Zohar, are the Sukim and the Gemara that are different than what we have in the Tanakh to be fixed, or do we fix the Sfarim? All of this is well known, it just doesn't jibe with the notion of the perfect pristine text, which really doesn't exist. I, I have a comment or a question, Simcha Mendelssohn. Yes. The, the issue of the noon is perfectly documented. I'm amazed. But I have a, my, my puzzle here is, when is it, the, how is it decided that that particular pasuk doesn't fit on the text? Well, you told it's, us the first time it doesn't yeah. fit, fine. But I would like to memorize, I would like to learn, when is it the first time or who was, that has been followed all along? We have ancient documents, the Gemara mentions them, that they knew this text was either misplaced in the Torah for whatever reason, or it came from somewhere else and was preserved. preserved. Those are ancient rabbinic traditions. The first time it was incorporated in the text of the Torah is lost to us. We don't have a text without Vayihi bin Soha Aaron, but we have the most ancient texts we know of that, that, that are Torah-like, where that set of 85 letters is marked with the appropriate editorial marks as being out of place or different unique, special, and Rabbi Shima Mengamliel says one day they'll put it back in its proper place. So where it happened first, I don't know, but we have lots of evidence that Chazal knew that that's what happened to it. And I, the story I would write is, there were 85 letters that were Vayibin Soharon, 
in a scroll that had been destroyed, because that's how the Mishnah describes this. And they decided that those 85 letters were from a kosher holy source, and they had to be preserved. So they sewed them into another text where it seemed logical, and that's what we have here today. We know that that kind of engineering operation to preserve texts was done in the ancient world because we have the Book of Treasar, which is clearly 12 documents sewn into one book that Chazal know as Treasar. So preservation by um, pasting, by cutting and pasting, is well known. And that could be an, another possible answer as to how this happened. I mean, the amazing thing is when you take the Torah out of their own codes, this is what we all say in, in uh, unison. Right, right, right. But that's because of the context. That's because of what the <laughs> words mean. That, that's a good point. But that, that's a drasha. That's not my historical analysis. And, that, and, I, and, and we always distinguish between the two. But you're right. It's, it's a text that everybody knows, which I think is one of the reasons this is sort of intriguing because we all sing this so often and we really don't know its context or the history that I've presented. That's, it's interesting. Wonderful. So that about. Yes, of course. My pleasure. Any other questions out there? Okay, you can always email me or drop over and uh, see what else there is to look at. There's more coming. Thanks for watching. See you soon. Have a good Chodesh. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Tadarabha. Tadarabha.